Sing and his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. again and cause the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he bought me and he saw me with
He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpected as a thief in the night. Heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. The very elements itself will disappear. And then we'll have true global warming, fire from the earth, and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment. So it's okay if you believe in global warming, because it's coming. But through God's way, he'll, just, he'll destroy it by fire. But I love the part that he says, no, he's being patient for your sake and those around you and your loved ones. Why? Because he wants everyone to be able to repent and he will not shut it down until that last one he knows has come to know him through Jesus Christ and be a child of God. So let's be patient with him as he continues to have us do his work for him as we fellowship with one another and as we go out and our representatives of God we're to be and do his work for him, and he will will and work within us that our desire will be his desire, and he will see that on the outside of what we do. So he's your he, he's your father, he's your king, he is King Jesus. And be patient as he allows and gathers his people unto him. And one day we'll all be together. We don't have to worry about all this, we don't have to worry about setting up chairs even, because everything will be taken care of in the heavens and we'll just be face to face. Sin will be no more. We're going to talk about that today. Sin will be no more. And we'll be living in the heavenly way about that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious understanding of us, Father, that uh, we go in patient. Father, we, we see a lot of things going on and it's just, Lord, what are you doing? Come on. Come on back. Let's just stop all this. And Father, thank you for reminding us that even as all this goes about, there's people that, because of their coming close to you, Father, and there are many questions, and Father, we're, we're looking at some of those, but Father, help us to see that your patience, Father, is a thing of beauty in order that all those that can come will come. And Father, you're not going to shut a door to anyone who wants to come to you, and you're going to wait for that day that it's time for you to say, no, we're done. So Father, we'll follow you, and in doing so, Father, let us just be ready to present the gospel, to show the gospel, and Father, be the gospel, the good news, Father, that you have placed in our hearts. Let our inward desire be our outward seen, Father. Let that be the most precious thing, that inwardly, Father, that you are close, and Father, you are willing within us to do those things that you've designed for us to do before the foundation of the world. So, Father, we surrender to you. We live in sacrifice. Pour us out as a drink offering. Father, we thank you. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together and sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. <coughs> Thou hast been 
Thank you. 
what's going on across the world. Very aware of China and Russia gathered together. Very aware that there's a possibility of some great disturbance can come about. And I want to tell you what I'm very aware of. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And he rules over all. It's not to be alarmed or surprised. We'll talk about that a little bit next week as we look at the relationship between God and evil. And you'll see the relationship, of course, is nil. It's just the absence of wholeness. And as we allow these things to bombard us, and they do, I want you to rest assured that your Father in Heaven knows exactly what's going on. And He will use every bit of this for the kingdom. So let's make sure that we're also ready to be used for the kingdom also. Ready to respond to those that are fearful in the beautiful understanding that we have of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let them know that we have a peace within that can't be disturbed because we have the great assurance of our home that Jesus has gone and prepared for us, a place that you and I will live eternally in paradise with him. So you're secure. And for a little while, all those there's Troubles and tribulation and trials. Fear not, for he is with you to the end of the ages and for eternity. So let's pray for Israel. Let's pray for our country. And individually, what's going on in your life? Bring that to the Father. Place it to him. If it's been a joyful week, praise God. Give him praise. If it's been difficult, praise him because it's been difficult because he's drawn you closer to you. But whatever you've gone through this week, know that our Lord Jesus Christ knew beforehand what was going through, and he will help you in a way that will bring you great, great joy to any circumstances of difficulty that you're going through. He will. If you need prayer, just lift your hand. I'll pray for you. God bless 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 me. God bless me. <laughs> We all need prayer. I praise God for the garage sale that's going on. I think that uh, one of the ladies, Faith, uh, is running up. I think she's ill today, so I think they'll shut it down and crank it back up later. Christine and all the families and the church body that's going over to help. Praise God. Thank you. It's going for a beautiful cause in Uganda. See, our desire is what God's love is. We want to continue to give of ourselves for the benefit of others. Of course, we need to name the precious Lord. If you want to pray where you are, please do silently. If you want to pray out loud, please do so. We're here together. We're the church gathered together with one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So you pray and I'll, I'll close and pray and we'll, in prayer and we'll, we'll see what God has to say. If he can change our hearts to look more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. So you pray for you are out loud, and I'll finish.
And Father, let them have that attitude also that you would have, Father, as you were going through difficult times or your son was going through difficult times that he just looked to you and said, your will be done and glorify you and then the great joy set before our Lord, Father, is what he looked at. So help us set forth our mind to the hearts to the great joy that lies before us. Help us not see the difficulty in a way that paralyzes us and sets us back. But Father, let us see it in a way that advances us, that we will be able to look more like you. And others can see that and wonder, how are you doing this with my Lord? Doing it with my Lord, he's helping me and guiding me. Father, we, we pray to be a witness regardless of what goes on in our life. Father, for those that have uh, young children, Father, or, or grandchildren, Father, and things are difficult or homes are broken and we're trying to work through and help them, Father, help us not take over where you need to do the work. Help us not to need it to be our result. Father, help us to see that your result is most important. So, Father, we, as you say in your word, we, Father, want to be a living sacrifice. Father, place us upon the altar. And Father, this is our worship, Father, our true worship to you, that we obey and submit and do what you would have us do. Father, thank you for loving us. Oh, good lands, Father, we, we, we don't much know anything at all, Father, except for what you tell us who you are, and that's what we want to keep in our minds. So, Father, your beauty just overwhelms us. Your joy, your love, your peace, your compassion that you have for us. So, Father, let us rest upon your word. Let it, let it transform us. Father, put us on the potter's wheel. Spin it, Father. And, Father, shake and mold us. And, Father, use the beautiful grace that you have to mold us and fill those cracks and broken places that we have, Father, with your precious, unconditional love, your steadfast, loving kindness. Father, we love you and thank you. Oh, Father, help me as I, as I preach the word. Father, your word. Father, may you be glorified. For it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen and amen. So we're in a series of questioning God, and we're going to take a look at what Genesis 131 says. And we're looking at, did you create sin? We began with this, and like next week we'll also get into God's relationship with what we think is evil and what we many times don't understand what's happening in the world or what's happening within our home. And what, what, what is this? I'm acknowledging you're all powerful and you're all knowing and you're all present and I know you want the best to happen so what in the world is going on with all this so when we we'll take a look at the maybe the easier one uh, of God did you create sin and of course we look at Genesis 131 and we see some creation he says and then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good and the evening passed and morning came and it marked the sixth day. As I was saying two Sundays ago, we braved through, it's okay to question God. And we discovered the answer to be in our motive for questioning God. And again, the issue is not whether we should or would question God, but the motive behind this questioning. And as we're desiring to draw closer to God in our understanding, is it our motive to attack our, His character or sovereignty as we draw closer to God? What's our understanding? What is our motive? You know, wondering why God allowed a particular event is completely different from directly questioning God's goodness and God's truthfulness. So he understands that we do not understand all things. In fact, the truth be known, we don't understand most things compared to what he knows because he's all-knowing. He doesn't have to consult anyone outside of himself to know what he knows because he perfectly knows everything because he knows all. So he understands why he might question what he allows, but does not cause. Having these doubts is different from questioning God's sovereignty and attacking his character. So in short, an honest question is not wrong or sinful. However, however, if our question is being presented in the form of a cross-examination from a bitter and untrusting or rebellious heart, we very well might need to be in. In fact, you are in need of a serious examination of your attitude and your motive before God. Ever been there? Sure. Remember, we ain't lying here either. So we all have been there. May not be in the sense of this much of an attack, but we've all, we've all seen things. So Lord, what's going on? 
So again, it's not wrong to question God. However, we should do so properly, having respect for His holiness. And I ask you to allow me to begin with a question similar to asking God if He had created evil. And the purpose was, and now is to help us in this time and using a different angle we might be familiar with, being sin. So, God, did you create sin? And, of course, the quick and the correct answer is, of course not. We pulled that off on our own. We did that very well ourselves. And we did not create it as we have no ability to create. We simply fell short of the standard that's set before us being God's holiness. We see this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says now, But the righteousness of God has been made known apart from the law, manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. But the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. This includes all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, God is our standard. He is the standard of holiness. He is the standard of moral perfectness. And so we fell and fallen short of that. And now, how do we get justified? Well, we're justified by His grace as a gift. And that word gift is a beautiful word because it says a ceremonial cleansing and the gift is Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been cleansed. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, meaning a, what? A substitute to take care of God's wrath, satisfying God's wrath against us. So he was a propitiation and propitiated us by Jesus' blood, by his blood, to receive by faith, by trusting in the works that Jesus did. And this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. What's former sins? It's the Old Testament. He passed over the former sins, but as a just God, he had to send someone to pay for their sins also, or he wouldn't be just. So justified is what God did, and he sent himself, his son, Jesus Christ, to become a man to pay for the sins of all, and now he is a just God. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We define sin. We need to look at it. It's a failure to conform to the moral law of God in an act, in an attitude, or in nature. We see Jesus preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, you know, if you look in lust, you're committing adultery. It wasn't just an outward act. It was mind, the inward act of the mind. So it was to show any failure or to conform to the moral law of God in an act, in an attitude, or in nature. That's why we need to approach God with our questions with the right motive. We don't want to have the wrong attitude. So we've fallen short. And falling short to meet the desired standard required by God to be in fellowship with Him for eternity. So back to our question, did God create sin? First of all, God did create. However, nil, which means none, not ever, sin. Nil, sin. God did not and cannot create in conflict or opposition to his nature. Why? Because God is holy and he's righteous and he's true. He can do nothing inconsistent with himself. Jesus writes under inspiration. James, I'm sorry, writes under inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. He says this, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Enduring temptation. Why? Because after they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, and I love this, don't say, God's tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. When you look at the words of tempted and tempted to do wrong and never tempts anyone else, one says that he doesn't directly tempt you, and the other word says he doesn't indirectly tempt you. He has nothing to do with tempting you whatsoever. So where does temptation come from then, Pastor? Well, temptation comes from my own desires, our own desires, which entice us and drag us, means lure us away. Then these desires give birth to sinful actions, and when the sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to a death. I love that word, drag and lure us away. If you look at that word in the Greek, anybody ever been fishing with a lure? That's what it is. The cast of temptation is thrown out there, and that little bug out there, if you're a fish, looks like the sweetest little thing in the world, although it's artificial. So you take the bait, and it drags you in. But God is saying here, don't take the lure. Don't be drug in.
came to it, say no at the time of temptation because it will give birth to your death. I love the pictures the Greek and the Hebrew gives. helps us understand and explain much more better God's word. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a sifting shadow. Never. See, all these verses and other verses make it perfectly clear. No, God cannot sin, be it a lie or be tempted even by evil. He can't be tempted by evil. Say, okay, Pastor, I get that. But back to my question, did he create sin? No, he did not. Allow me to explain it from Scripture. We are familiar with the verse in the first chapter of Genesis. It says, God created the universe, or verses, God created the universe in six days. But originally, the universe had nil sin. Everything he made was, as he said, good, very good. God looked over what he had made. He saw that it was very good, and the evening passed, and the morning marked the sixth day. These words, very and good, express what we call excellence in creating, abundance in word. Having extreme beauty, his creation is good, very, very good. So where did it come from? How did it come into the universe? First, we must clearly affirm, again, that God did not sin. God is not to be blamed for sin. It was human beings who sinned, and it was angels who sinned. And in both cases, they did so by willfully and voluntarily having a free will, a free choice, or as we refer to this as having, as I said, free will. And having not created themselves, they had to have been created. And having not been able to create themselves, they had to have been created as such, nil, sin. God created humans and angels with a free will, a free desire, thus choosing to obey him or to disobey him. See, to blame God for sin would be blasphemy against the character of God. We verify this truth seen throughout God's word. In Deuteronomy, we see the torch being passed from Moses to Joshua. And Joshua is to lead the people into the promised land as they wandered for 40 years. And then Joshua was given the right to go in. So in preparation of sending them off, Moses wrote the entire body of the instructions, the law, in a book. Look at this. And he gave it to the priests who carried the Ark of the Lord the Covenant and then to the elders of Israel for the purpose, of course, of reading it every seven years. But I want you to notice the word in caps, L-O-R-D. They're all in capitalization. Strictly speaking, the Lord, Yahweh, is the only proper name for God. Translated in English Bibles, Lord is in all caps and is distinguished from L-O-R-D, first capital L, and then smaller case, L-O-R-D, O-R-D, which means Adonai, which means deliverer. We see that with Abraham. When Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son, the God delivered him from that, and that was called, he said, you're Adonai. This is the place of deliverance now. But the name in all caps specifies this, an immediate, immediacy and a presence. Yahweh the Lord is present, is what Moses is saying. He's accessible. He's near to all those who call on him for deliverance, for forgiveness, and for guidance. And the book of instructions was to be read to the entire nation every seventh year. Can you imagine one of our leaders in the country that says, all right, this is the seventh year. Gather together, America. We're going to read God's word. Why does that seem foreign to us? Isn't that the way it should be? Wow. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but in this passing the torch, Moses wrote a song. You know Moses was a songwriter? He did. He was. God read the song, right? That Moses had it. Moses wrote a song and, and recited its entirety publicly to the assembly of Israel as passing the torch. We, sign, we find this song in Deuteronomy, just a part of it. I love it. He's saying, and I won't try to sing it, Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words I say. Let my, of course the Lord's, teaching fall on you like rain. In other words, let my speech settle like the dew. Let my words fall like rain on tender grass. Let gentle showers, like gentle showers on young plants. He says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. So Moses is letting the nation of Israel, that, letting them know that the nation of Israel, that the Lord Yahweh is what? The Lord is present. 
He's accessible to you. He's near to those who call on him for deliverance. He's near if you need forgiveness. He's near if you need guidance. He's got what you need. Call upon him. And in verse 4, we see our Lord's holiness. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is faithful God who does no wrong. He is just and upright as he is. And he does not create sin, nor does he tempt you in any evil, nor is he ever tempted by evil. He is holy, holy, holy. We even see Job's friend, Elihu, demands of him to proclaim the holiness of God. He says, listen to me, you who have understanding. Everyone knows that God doesn't sin. The Almighty can do no wrong. He repays people according to their deeds. He treats people as they deserve. And as we've seen before, it's impossible for even for God to desire to do wrong because he cannot even be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Pastor, how did sin get here? Which brings us back to something we glossed over a little earlier called free will. First of all, allow me to ask you this. Do you agree that we are free in our will and in our choices? Yeah. You just choose what you want, don't you? Is that a big mistake God made? Or you rather he didn't make you a robot who you, he commanded and you had to act properly in accordance and you couldn't have any leeway? He gave you a choice to love and obey him or to reject him. In fact, we are free in the greatest sense that any creature of God could be free. We are able to make willing choices, choices that have real effects, real consequences, and real blessings. Like Adam and Eve, we're aware of no restraints on our will from God when we make decisions. We have the power of willing choice. Otherwise, we will fall into the error that we refer to as fatalism or determinism and thus conclude that our choices do not matter or that we cannot really make willing choices. And if our choices are not our will, they're not our desire and do not matter, then we cannot truly choose to love or to care or even to hate or dislike. We're just programmed to do what God wants us to do and we can do nothing else. You have a choice. And we should have no consequences also. And we should have no consequences or responsibility for what we do not rightly have choice in. You wouldn't have to bear the consequence if it wasn't your responsibility and your doing. But we do. And here's how it all came about. So God created human beings and angels with free will. And having free will, there is at least the potential that those with a free will will choose badly. I've chosen badly. I've fallen short of the glory of God. I've fallen short of His moral standard in act and in motive and in whatever the other one I said, I forgot. It was there. I've fallen short of all of them. And I need a redeemer because I have no way to get back to righteousness and stand before God. And I can't abide by the law because I have broken the law. I don't get a do-over in trying to complete the law. So I must depend upon Jesus Christ and his works that he did. He fulfilled the law and the prophets and he obeyed God perfectly. And I says, Mike, put your faith in me and you get all my work. You get my righteousness and you get forgiveness of sin. And now God will justify you rightly to stand before him and you'll be holy without blame. You'll be accepted and have value and you'll have the power of the Holy Spirit working within you. Why in the world wouldn't anybody want that? But people don't. They want to do it on their own. They want to proclaim their own way, create their own identity and build up their own name. Let me tell you, be building up the name of the Lord. He's the name above all names. And every day, every name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're just doing it now. So sin, the failure to conform to the moral law of God and act, attitude, or nature, there it is, entered the universe, how? Due to an act of rebellion against God and not because God created sin. Who's the first? Good old Satan. He's a created being, not a human being. For a human being, Adam and Eve. Going back to creation, 
We find that God created you and I, humans, in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God looked over what he had made, and once again, he saw it was very, very good. Adam and Eve were created. Nil sin with a free will in the beginning of creation. All he had to do was obey God. There was no intercessory in between there. There was no priest there between them. It was God and them. Obey. And they chose not to. And here we go. So they were created. Nil sin with free will. Including free will and creation involves the ability of the one with free will to choose what one desires. They were able to choose to obey God or disobey Him. And after God communicated the moral standard, remember, He gave them the moral standard beforehand. This wasn't a trick. This wasn't to see if they could do it. He gave them everything they needed. And after He communicated the moral standard, He gave the man Adam a true choice as found in Genesis 2, 15 and 17. Here's what He said. The Lord placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Here's where we find that Adam was given a true choice to obey or disobey. And God warned him, Adam, you may freely eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you, in other words, Adam, it's your choice. But if you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. There's the choice. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. Look, I love this. This is so important in our family. With our, especially with our children growing up, we use our grandchildren now. We probably don't throw their blood to the back if they want to. I don't. You do. No. I'm the one that does. In fact, Debbie sets the structure a little bit tight for me, too. I don't know why. Me and those kids have to rebel a little bit. Anyway, I love this. What, what the Lord did was, we can do this with the people that we come, come across to. Look, here's the rules. Here's what's going to happen. Now look, let me very calmly tell you the consequence with it also. So there won't be any fight when you do this. We'll just enact the consequence because you chose not to obey. I love that. I love how that works in our family with our kids. Okay, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. But you know, you're going to have a choice because they do. But if you do, understand that we'll be doing this, this, and this. So when it happens, you don't have to say, why did you do that? Okay, let, let's enact the consequence of what we're going to do. What's the idea? We want to build character, not punish, right? We want to build character in the children, not punish children or one another. So it's your choice, Adam. You want the consequence? Or you want to have You want life or death, Adam? Adam chose. And what did he do? He willed to be what? Disobedient. So we need to understand this about our loving Father, our Lord. God did not tempt. He did not coerce or lure Adam in any way or any form, be it directly or indirectly, as I said before, into disobedience. He did not. His desire for Adam was to live in a loving way in the garden and tend the garden, and God loved to walk with Adam in the garden. It was his joy. So in James 1.13, it verifies that God did not do this in any way to tempt horse or lure Adam. So when tempted, James says, no one, no one should say God is tempting you. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God allowed Adam the dignity of free choice and honored that choice with appropriate consequences. Look at Romans 5, 12 through 19 explains clearly where sin came from. Romans 5, 12 through 19. When Adam sinned, there it is. What does that say? Sin entered the world. Scripture speaks for that's what God said. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam sinned brought what? Death. Why? Because God said if you eat of that, you're going to die. So it brought death. And so what happened? Death spread to everyone. For now everyone has sinned. I can't blame Adam for my sin because you know what? I have sinned myself. 13. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. Remember, the law didn't show up about 430 plus years from Abraham until Moses showed up. But the law, 
the people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of the Lord as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol. What is he? A representation of Christ who was yet to come. What are you talking about? Okay, there's a difference. Look at this, verse 15. There's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. Look at this. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift, his ceremonial sacrifice of his son, of forgiveness to many through his other son named Jesus Christ. Through one man came death, through another man came eternal life. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of the one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But look at this. But God's free gift leads our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. It's his righteousness that you now have. For the sin of one man, Adam caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death. Though this is the one through the one man, Jesus Christ. You see what this is saying? Death is not the victory. The victory's been won. It's not an equal power of good and evil. Good has triumphed in Jesus Christ. Evil is nothing more than what? The absence of holiness. And holiness always triumphs evil. You have triumphed evil in your life. You have overcome death because you place your faith and love in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. And that is the only reason you're escaping death. Your penalty for death right now is, is gone. You will die, but you don't have a penalty because sin has been erased. You just die to go be in the presence of the Lord. Bring it on. That's, that's not such a bad deal, is it? To be in the presence of the Lord. The absence of the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. Yes, verse 18, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a brand new life for everyone. And because one person disobeyed God, many become sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. They're made righteous through Christ. So God provided the opportunity to sin, but he did not create or instigate sin. He gave us free will. See, having the opportunity to disobey or obey God was good. Without it, you and I and all beings would be little more than mere robots we talked about before. And because we have choice, God commands, pleads, and encourages us to follow him. I've got those verses listed at the bottom of the page there if you want to look those up. But each of those words that I've just spoken about being pleads and encourages and forgives. He promises blessings. He promises fellowship and promises protection when we obey. But he does not and will not chain or bind our will. He wants you to love him out of the motive of what he's done for you. He wants true children that are able to love, able even to reject him, able to even hate him, but he wants us to choose to love him because of what he's done for us. You know, God could have created a foolproof structure around the forbidden tree of the Garden of Eden. There wouldn't have been any problem for him. He created it all. He could have just created the concrete barrier no one could have gotten through. I'll tell you though, Adam and Eve would still have sinned as they would be upset God did such a thing as putting a concrete structure around the tree they couldn't get to. In doing so, they might even think, how dare God do such a thing? Did he not trust us not to eat this fruit? Boom. They've sinned. Questioning the character of God. Adam and Eve had a freedom to choose obedience or disobedience. And when they chose to disobey, they also chose the consequences that went with it. And the same is true for every human being since. The opportunity to sin is inherent in our freedom of choice. We can choose to seek God, which leads to righteous living, or we can choose to follow our own inclinations, which lead us away from God. What's your choice? What are you choosing? You know, as children of God, we can still choose to disobey Him, can't we? 
What's the only difference? We still kind of see him in heaven. But that's, he has placed us in our position with him, holy and blame, righteous, without sin. The Bible's clear. Whatever path we choose, consequences will follow. God did not create sin. However, he did something about it. Love this. He came to get us out of what we got ourselves into. He came back. He did not have to. But because of his love, he did. And once he pointed towards this way to us, he was obligated to go all the way with it. And he did. All the way. He says, for this is how I now love the world because of sin entering into it. And because of the choice they made, this is how I love the world. I gave my only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And his desire is that all come to repentance and experience the blessings and joy of eternal life with him. That is the will and desire of the Father. But he leaves the choice up to you and me. Praise God, we've placed our faith and we've obeyed in that degree that he even helped us with the faith. But praise God, it's up to him that he decided to send his son and redeem us. No, God didn't sin. Mm -mm. But boy, he took care of it, didn't he? He came back and took care of it of our wrong, and he himself made it right on the cross. Let's pray. Father, thank you for free choice. Father, it helps us understand the beauty of the love that you have for us. Although, Father, we disobeyed, your love was greater than our disobedience, and you gave it everything you had, your precious son, for us. Father, there wasn't anything in us that said, Okay, I think you're doing well. I'll give you my son. No, it was your pure love for us that you gave your son. And Father, we're so grateful for that. And Father, thank you for helping us understand the beauty of who you are. Father, you are holy, and we will continue in this, Father. Father, help us to start to see the relationship between you and the evil that we're seeing. Help us see that in the kingdom's eye, Father, that our heart may be warmed with the beauty of who you are and be so thankful that you came because can I, I can't imagine what it'd be like if your presence wasn't even here ever. Father, did it, oh, Father, it would be it, it's be unexplainable. So Father, just thank you for coming. Thank you for coming back for us and bring us back into your kingdom. Father, we love you and thank you for it in Christ's name that I pray. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together and say, no one cared, ever cared for me like Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. Tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness. Words 
of love. But I'll never know just how he came to save me. Till a day I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. Thank you. He does care for me. Well, hello, Dancing. I'm just dancing.